Very good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome here to the Scottish Parliament. My name is Ben McPherson, and I'm, I'm a, a member of the Scottish Parliament here for Edinburgh Northern and Leith constituency, uh, just over there. And I'm really delighted to be chairing today's event on responsible debate and to be doing so in this 20th year of the Festival of Politics, in the 25th year of this Scottish Parliament being reconvened. The 20 years of this Festival of Politics have provided provoking, inspiring and informative discussion for people of all ages and every walk of life for five spirited days of debate and, and this is of course the last one and we're really delighted that you're here with us for this discussion and it will be a discussion together. I'm looking forward to hearing many of your thoughts and views and it's really important especially for today's topic on responsible debate that we speak to each other in a way where we respect each other's contributions and differences of opinion so let's just all keep that in mind. Also, if you want to take part online today, the Scottish Parliament has accounts on X, formerly known as Twitter, and also on Instagram, if you want to post your photos or, or thoughts about today. Today's debate is in partnership with the Centre for Responsible Debate. And just to let you know as well, the session is being recorded and will be put on the Scottish Parliament's YouTube channel in a, a number of weeks. So I'm very pleased to be joined today by a, a, a really brilliant group of panellists as well as yourself. First of all, I've got that Dr Alice Kornig, um, who is a senior lecturer in classics at the University of St Andrews, specialising in peace and conflict studies. Uh, while a member of the Young Academy of Scotland, she also worked with colleagues to establish a charter for responsible debate. Next, we have Olive, uh, Quinton Oliver, uh, who is a conflict and referendum specialist based on his experiences in Northern Ireland. He set up Stratagem, a public policy lobbying agency after running the 1998 Good Friday Agreement referendums Yes campaign. We also have uh, Vitaly Dyakov, who is a, a lawyer and accredited mediator in Ukraine and Scotland with an extensive background in commercial, school and family mediation. Uh, he also volunteers as a board member of the Scottish Refugee Council. Uh, and last, we have John Sturrock KC, who, after a career in law, John has spent 20 years as a, a mediator and facilitator, uh, dealing with complex disputes and working with senior figures in business, the public sector, sport, government and politics. Uh, and he is also founder of uh, Collaborative Scotland and author of its commitment to respectful dialogue. So we'll get started. And um, first of all, uh, before I bring you all in as soon as I can, I'm just going to start off with some questions uh, for our panel uh, to get their first thoughts on, on these matters. And the first question I, I have is, you know, what is responsible debate? Um, how is, is it different from the kinds of debate we might typically see in politics today? And, and is there any advice you'd, you'd give someone, you'd give all of us, uh, looking to engage in more productive political debates with people in our, in our lives? And Alice, perhaps you could start us off. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. I think it's really easy to define what not responsible debate is. We see quite a lot of it, debate that polarises, debate that uses inflammatory language, that divides rather than unites. Defining responsible debate is a more ambitious but very much more important task. And I would define it quite boldly as everyday peace work. So if we think of de debate that is not responsible as something that divides and creates conflict, um, drives tensions that might simply emerge within the family but might emerge within the workplace or on the streets, and we have seen that absolutely in very recent weeks, um, the alternative to that is everyday peace work. So to put a bit more detail on that, um, responsible debate involves listening, 
um, and being willing to listen to diverse perspectives and diverse experiences. And for me, responsible debate is about um, being outcomes focused, thinking about the solutions at the end, not am I going to win with my position, but what solutions are we actually trying to achieve together? And so rather than competitive and combative um, and debate, I'm a classicist, so I think about the sort of origins of words and it's uh, it comes from the idea of fighting it out it's it's it, it's got a long history of being quite combative um, but collaborative debate where we are actually seeking common ground um, and shared purpose is one of the ways in which i define responsible debate and if we think about any issue whether that's scottish independence or whatever it might be if we go far enough back on any issue we do find places where we agree with each other, places where we have at least common ground. And if we work from there, then we think about the interests and the needs that we share. Um, so co collaborative, everyday piecework is how I would define responsible debate. So co collaboration, John, as the founder of Collaborative Scotland, do you want to come in on? Uh, I didn't expect to bring me in so early, Ben. Uh -huh. But can I just say, uh, or recognise, Ben, all the efforts that you have made over the years to try to engage more responsibly in political debate in, in the Scottish Parliament and elsewhere. And in saying that, I'm going to be a wee bit controversial, if I may, is that OK? Uh, but respect, very much respectfully so. Um, I, I, I wrestle with the word debate. So when I hear responsible debate, I know exactly how this, where you're going and what, what you're seeking to achieve. But I then wonder about the word debate. And I wonder if that's maybe part of the problem, because the word debate comes, as I understand it, from the French debat which means to knock down, and to knock down with force. And what debate suggests, and it goes right back to Aristotle, and it really is part of our whole Western political tradition, as manifested in the Westminster model of politics, debate suggests putting up an argument, and, put, and somebody else putting up another argument, and looking to knock down each other's argument. In other words, the win-lose, uh, good-bad paradigm, if you like. So I would like us to, to, to think about that word and maybe even move away from that word. So that takes me to dialogue. And one of the reasons that we founded Collaborative Scotland back at the time of the 2014 referendum was that we wanted to encourage people not to put up arguments on either side and knock each other down, yes or no, in or out, or whatever it might be, but to think about what we might do together. So the word dialogue has connotations of working with, of flow. And I think about Edward de Bono, the great a, thinker, lateral thinker was his thing back in the 60s and 70s. He talks about building on each other's ideas to try to maximise or optimise outcomes. So I think that, that would be my, my, my contribution to the idea about what we can do differently and how we can think differently. So far as doing things differently, um, Alice has already mentioned one or two, and the cards on, that you have in your chairs, don't, don't spend time now, outline eight ideas which are the commitment to respectful dialogue. And I think two things I want to emphasise are, are, are one, what Alice has said about listening, absolutely critical. We've got two ears and one mouth, use them in that proportion. Always listen to find out what the others truly need and are truly thinking. Cardinal Newman, as he then was, said, um, when people truly understand what each other mean, controversy is superfluous or hopeless. So deep understanding is our objective. I'm going to differ, if I may, with Alice, and my last point is this. I don't think we should be looking for solutions. I don't think we can anticipate what the solutions are going to be until we've had our deep exploration and gained our deep understanding. And out of that may come all sorts of creative outcomes that we hadn't even thought about when we first started. So be very careful about jumping to solutions or outcomes too early in the conversations that you have. Enough for me to start off, Ben. Thank you, John. And um, Quentin, did you um, want to, to come in now and? Uh, that balance between collaboration and peace is, of course, something that you've been deeply involved in through your, your career. Yes, thanks for, uh, for the introduction and for uh, hosting this. This is an important uh, discourse, if I can split the difference between debate uh, and dialogue. Uh, and we don't do it enough, and we probably don't have the right people in the room, uh, which is a shame. Uh, I come from a place called Northern Ireland, for some people, it's called Northern Ireland, but even the use of that term is controversial. Mm -hmm. For others, it is the north of Ireland uh, or the province or the six counties. And we can laugh about that, but it's deeply important. People have died mm -hmm. for those things. 
And even though it's a geographic uh, impossibility because the south is further north than the north uh, in geographical terms uh, in the way Donegal behaves, uh, but because our debate is about identity and to which nation do we belong, are we part of the UK or part of Ireland, uh, it is deeply controversial and therefore the language is important uh, and also the way in which that language is deployed and what we make of it. I occupy two worlds. One is as a campaigner and the other is as a policy person. And in a way, I hate myself for some of the things, some of the ways I behave. But as a campaigner, I am trying to knock down the other side. I'm trying to promote my side and say, well, your argument is weak because, oh, that won't last. Oh, you haven't made it sustainable. Oh, you don't have the resources or whatever it is uh, in order to do it. And then when I become a policy person, uh, I'm trying to trade and to say, well, that's part of a good idea. Can we build on it? Can we add to it? Can we collaborate? Can we get people on? Can we build a coalition? Now, I think I'm good at both because I occupy both worlds. And some people only are campaigners and others only policy people. And is it better that they are specialists? So how do we find the ways to come together in order to achieve whatever is the result? Is it an outcome that we predetermine we want in Alice's formulation? Or is it discourse in order to improve the level of understanding that something might happen that we don't have a view on? Or do we have a view on it? And therefore, the context is very important. And talking about context, Vitaly, you have operated in, of course, two countries in your, your time as a mediator um, in a, a short yet eventful life, you were saying earlier in our pre meet the youngest panellist, but a lot to draw on. And you know, what, what, what are your thoughts when it comes to responsible debate or respectful dialogue, as, as John differentiated that? Um, my thoughts that it's good to have debate rather than not to have debate, because when we avoid some important topics, we actually lose the opportunity to explore um, what other people think uh, and explain our point of view. I think this, this is really crucial because if we don't get to that stage, we end up in assumptions and our own perceptions and we, we don't engage with each other. And from like my perspective as a lawyer, I spent 12 years litigating, so promoting, advocating for my clients to win a case, but it's very rarely you win 100% of a case. And this is the expectation that you go into a debate, you hope to win in the debate, but the, the reality is different. And it's very important to think about what the outcomes of the debate, really we want to win or we want to explore. This is, I think, is really important. The other thing is, is a cultural aspect because um, it's differently how people communicate in Ukraine and in uh, in UK, in, in Scotland. Uh, and acknowledging these differences when you're debating with, with people, because what was explorative for me in UK that there is very diverse communities. People from different countries, different cultures live um, in one country and they have rela relationships and, and, and they live quite peacefully. So re respect, respectful to other cultural differences is very important. And of course, when, when we uh, um, see in our culture how things are done, we want to achieve some outcomes that is good like from our perspective, but it doesn't mean that it's good from other perspectives. So ac ac acknowledging that we need also to explore the different uh, points of view, I think it's very important. Absolutely, and uh, culture and, and background, of course, uh, whether that's language or um, the circles around us or the, the common practices and rituals, all of this feeds into what I think is fascinating in this whole scenario of, of how, do we, how do we speak well and disagree agreeably is perception. Uh, one of the things in politics I think it's good to try and remember is that most people from their different perceptions want to make things better and are trying their best. And you know, how, how important is, is that 
concept of, of perception, whether it's uh, political persuasion in terms of a, a certain ideology or uh, nationality or religion or, or uh, social economic background. And how, what's, what, what do we need to do more of to create the space for nuance and uh, application in the grey areas and these many challenges that we face together? I don't know who, who would like to, to take that on. Maybe start with you, John, and come along the, the, um, the panel here. I think perception is the, an interesting word, isn't it? Because we see what we see from where we sit, from our particular orientation. When I work as a mediator, I have one visual aid that I use always, and it's a remarkably successful, although simple. I put up a, a, a picture on a flip chart of a piece of cheese and invite people to think about the different perspective or vantage points that people have looking at that piece of cheese. So if you look at it from one angle, you see a rectangle. From another angle, you see a square. And from the top down, you see a triangle. Assume a piece of brie or camembert or whatever. And for each individual, seeing it from their particular perspective, that's their truth. And the reality is, of course, that there are multiple truths. Each will say, well, I'm right, because that's what I see and what I perceive to be correct. But in reality, there are all sorts of different perspectives. So one of the key things for all of us is to try to find uh, the way to see it from another's perspective, or if we're acting in a, an independent or mediator role, helping others to see it from other perspectives. So I think it's, it's really important. I think there's this wonderful TED talk, The Danger of a Single Story. Um, and the danger of a single story, thinking that there's only one truth, uh, when in fact, of course, there are multiple truths. In fact, I've got a quotation here, which I'll... I'll just uh, pass on after this. Hegel said, genuine tragedies in the world are not conflicts between right and wrong. They're conflicts between two rights. Food for thought. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Vitaly, um, you, you spoke about the different cultures you've, you've worked yeah. in, in in Scotland and Ukraine. I mean, what, what, uh, whether it's mediation or your other work and your work on the Scottish Refugee Council, well, you know, what are your thoughts on how background shapes people's perspectives? First of all, it, it's, it's important to say your story um, so other person can understand because, for example, if, they, if I meet someone from, from other culture and I don't know much about this culture, I will stick to the, those knowledge I have or I have picked up from a um, social media, internet, uh, or what I've discussed with, previously with my colleagues. So it's important to hear the stories um, and to tell those stories. And it's about inclusion that no one left behind and everybody has their voice. So it's important to, um, to tell our stories. And I think it's, and from cultural perspective, there is no single like understanding of the culture. Each person will understand it from their point of view. And if you take, for example, Ukraine, there is a big country and there is people will be, have different cultures in different parts of Ukraine. At the same in Scotland, so there is no one Scottish culture, there is multiple cultures. And it's important to acknowledge that there is no, like, it's good to have multiple understanding of things. Absolutely, and, and, and Quentin, of course, you, this, these considerations of background will have been very significant in the work you've done. Yes, one of the things we do when we go into a conflict in another country is explore what are the founding myths uh, of the different players in the conflict. What is it that's driving them to their truth, to their rightness, as Hegel said? Uh, and to understand those is really important uh, because if you just uh, read it or take a superficial uh, uh, reading from one party, it's not going to help you. Uh, and that covers language and use of language. Uh, although uh, I was trying to explain the issue of Northern Ireland versus North of Ireland uh, to a group of Iraqi armed groups uh, a few years ago. And I hadn't briefed the interpreters, unfortunately, which is one lesson, always brief the interpreters when you're going to deal with nuance and complicated uh, issues. And I said, and some people call it Northern Ireland, and those people are trying to kill the other people who call it uh, the North of Ireland. And the interpreters were translating both as Irlanda Shamalea. 
uh, uh, so the people who call it Northern Ireland are trying to kill the people who call it Northern Ireland and the people who call it Northern Ireland, and it was a disaster. So a couple of lessons in that one. Uh, similarly, just the terminology, paramilitaries is one of the terms we use for illegal armed groups. Uh, but in Colombia, for example, uh, it is a particular form of right wing uh, pro then government militia. So it had an entirely different perspective than illegal groups. So use of language is important. Uh, and the other thing we ask is about spoilers. Who are the spoilers in this discourse? Uh, and should we have them in the room? Because they're important and you have to be inclusive and their spoiling could be disruptive. Or do you exclude them because they're spoilers? Uh, and that's where you need rules of engagement if you're in a track two or two and a half uh, uh, process, as we call the various tiers of diplomacy, before you get formal talks between the various parties. And it's really hard to work it out because Mandela was deemed to be a spoiler for a long time. The IRA, the armed groups in Northern Ireland uh, uh, and so forth, the FARC uh, and the ELN in Colombia. So, so at what stage does a spoiler who's in the out group, and that might be the problem that they're seen as in the out group and they're being tried to be marginalised by the forces of power, at what stage do they become legitimate and on what terms are they part of the process, informal and then formal. Uh, and those are really key to work out in advance and to be sensitive and iterative because things will change as it goes along. Fascinating in terms of the importance of perception and language and everything that comes from that and can, can happen from that positively or negatively. And as a peace builder and an, an advisor, Alice, you with, whether it's the grey areas, the nuance, the perception of language, you must be engaged in that. Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things that um, everyone else has brought out already is that respectful dialogue, responsible debate, peace work, it's hard work, right? It's incredibly easy to lob a rhetorical hand grenade and momentarily quite satisfying sometimes. Um, but being in the same room as spoilers, as people who have actually, who are perpetrators of violence, whether that's real armed violence or other kinds of violence, is very, very difficult. Um, there is an approach to peace building that's very controversial because it requires so much emotional labour um, on the part of the people involved, and it's called agonistic peace building, and it involves uh, um, tackling this issue of the tyranny of the single narrative, and both uh, Vitali and John were talking about the, the problems where you have just a single story that's reductive and you know, might reduce all refugee experiences to one refugee experience, or all Ukrainian experiences, or Scottish... Um, uh, and, and agonistic peace building involves, in places as complex as Israel and Palestine, seeing if it is possible to hold two stories or more in one space. And they might be stories that um, talk about the foundation of the State of Israel and the Nakba in the same place. Now, we all know how incredibly difficult that is, really very, very difficult. It's, it's difficult because people are very emotionally, for good reason, there's intergenerational trauma, people are emotionally attached um, to their histories, whether they're as, as problematic as that or, or much more, uh, much, you know, smaller scale kinds of conflict. Um, so agonistic peace building, holding multiple stories in one space, um, I've just given you a really difficult example, but even at a smaller scale, it's, it's very difficult, but it is absolutely crucial if debate is to be exploratory, reflective, um, uh, and uh, absolutely not trying to sort of set out with an outcome that you've got in mind already, but, but explore what the outcomes are that are of, in, of, you know, that reflect the needs and interests of everyone in the room. And I think one thing I would want to add to this piece about um, nuance and greyness is what, one of the things that we don't look hard at is how our debates and our discussions are structured and who is marginalised and who is included. Um, and, and part of actually bringing in nuance and grey areas is uh, about really questioning, well, whose voices do we kind of repeatedly hear from and who gets this platform again and again and again? Um, and what happens when we uh, um, bring in some of those different voices, those different cultural experiences, those different perspectives, those different stories, and set multiple stories alongside each other rather than the kind of authoritative um, stories that we've already heard a fair amount about and voices we've heard a lot from? Absolutely, and uh, I'm, I'm going to bring John in a minute who wants to add something, but, and then I'm going to come to, to all of you and, and we'll, we'll start our, 
a collective discussion. But, but before I do that, and, and after John, if any of you as panellists want to, to say something about, uh, you talked about the situation in the, in the Middle East. I, I mentioned that we're tw in our 25th year of devolution, we're almost a quarter of the way through the 21st century. Whether it's here in Scotland or on a global context, whether it's the situation in the Middle East or U Ukraine, or in considering the, the huge problems of, that are absolutely collective of climate change and the technological revolution of AI, you know, these really big challenges. I, I, I don't know if, as, as experts and advisors, do you want to say something just about the, the need for responsible debate, respectful dialogue? in this time of, of great challenge. John and, and I'll Well, I'll try, I'll try and um, weld, weld, transition into that for me. There's a great phrase uh, which came, I found in a book by the great Scottish uh, prophet, really, Alistair Macintosh. I don't know if you come across Alistair Macintosh, but he, called, he used the phrase Caledonian anti-syzygy. And that's apparently the presence of dueling polarities within one entity. And I think that nicely captures the complexity of all this. And I want to just add one point about complexity, the complexity of the human beast and understanding that. I, I'm not an expert in neuroscience. However, I have over the years got more and more of an understanding, I think, or gained more of an understanding about the way our brains work. And we know that from prehistoric times, we're wired in a certain way, which is protective and also defensive and also aggressive, if necessary, if we're presented with frightening, dangerous, or other situations which cause us threat. And that remains a part of our wiring. It's the fight or flight or freeze wiring. And when people, and there are so many people in the world these days who are feeling disenfranchised, um, unrepresented, um, undervalued, for, for these people, it's entirely understandable that they would seek to group themselves in a particular way, perhaps in their tribes, exclude others, feel threatened, perhaps use language and indeed use actions which appear to others to be oppressive or aggressive. So I think it's really important to bear in mind that part of our, our makeup. In some ways, we are, it's Daniel Kahneman's System 1 and System 2, isn't it? System 1 is that fight or flight, that instinctive survival mode. System 2 is when we pause and we think and we're more rational and thoughtful, but that's difficult when we're under pressure. So the same a reaction as would happen if we were faced with a furry, dangerous beast is often what happens to us when we're faced with threats in our workplace or political environment or whatever. And that leads me just into the Middle East and into Ukraine as well. And I'm going to be quite careful what I say about this. But I think we need to understand at a deep level why certain behave, people, people behave in a certain way, thinking about what I've just said about fight or flight and fear. I don't know what lies behind the way that Vladimir Putin actually thinks, nor... Uh, President Netanyahu, but I do wonder sometimes if the way they think is informed by loss, fear, threat, and all of these things that cause them to behave in ways that are completely uh, beyond the pales of ours we are concerned. So it's a plea really for an understanding of how we as humans think, how our brains work, and then very tentatively a suggestion that we seek to apply that to some of the really difficult issues that present themselves in the world today. Absolutely. And that sort of empathy is really important, but it needs more, because if it is a gut and instinctive behaviour, as you're suggesting, uh, that some of those characteristics lead to, how do you get people out of it uh, without appearing really patronising and really arrogant that we know best and you're just behaving like a lizard brain uh, and so on. So really difficult and that goes to their interests. What are the interests? Because you can't allow some of those founding myths of the uh, greater Rus or whatever it is to survive. And it struck me today actually, uh, I was at a uh, wonderful fringe the, in the other festival uh, show this morning, uh, one woman show about Gaza, uh, and it was it was brilliant uh, for me because I was emotionally ready to receive it, but I wondered if there were Israelis in the room, would they be? And then I wondered, there is a dispute which is so sensitive, we can hardly talk about it without risking uh, talking about it uh, in case of offence, even if it's manufactured offence. And yet in Ukraine, most of the West is supportive. 
Uh, now I have a few Russian friends who are giving me alternative views, but most people aren't getting those, I think. Therefore, we are perpetuating and accentuating some of those features that John uh, has described. Uh, and yet, uh, uh, so there you've got a disparity in, in two current conflicts. Uh, nobody knows about Sudan. I mean, there's the most horrible uh, civil war going on in Sudan. No one knows about it. Everyone's forgotten about Cyprus because there's no violence. Therefore, we'll forget about that. Uh, so how do we prioritize? Who are we you know, to, to prioritize these things? And how do we let people do it, but also as part of an international community, find some locus for advancing whatever it is, debate, discourse, compromises, but compromise is a dirty word. In conflict, compromise is the dirtiest word because it means sell out. Uh, it doesn't mean trade off in policy terms, it's trade off, uh, which is, can be a reasonable trade off. Okay, I'll give you this, Ben, if you'll allow me that. Uh, but in conflict, it's treachery for the people behind you uh, who are possibly the most important people, not the ones across the table. It's the people behind you who, uh, uh, in your tribe, group, camp, entity. Very well said. And Alice. If, yeah, if we think in terms of tribes, then compromise is a bad thing. But one of the principles in the Young Academy of Scotland Charter for Responsible Debate is it encourages us to celebrate when someone changes our mind. And that actually does bring me back to Ben's question about social media. Um, very early on in our development of the Charter, we had a really wonderful um, uh, social media entrepreneur come and talk to us about uh, um, a, a piece of software. I'm not actually completely IT literate myself. Um, a, a tool, an app, I don't know what it was. It was uh, uh, something that tried to reward you not for sort of liking something you already like and agreeing with people who you already agree with, but um, it was something where you gave points or you used to give thumbs up or whatever when someone had changed your mind. And it, it, it limped on for two or three years, but it didn't get funding, it didn't get traction. And I think that speaks to a couple of points that both John and, and Quinton have raised about the... You're right, John, as, as I understand it, that there's a lot of psychological research that shows that we're really wired to respond in a heightened way to danger um, and to negative things as well. And that's what we see on social media all the time. And it's that quick button response. Um, I feel threatened. I'm going to lash out. I'm going to respond. But to come to Quentin's point about empathy, another part of our so psychological makeup is that humans uniquely as a species have empathy as a superpower. Right? It's one of the things that we do that most other creatures in the world don't do. The ability to imagine walking in someone else's shoes. And that's a superpower that we need to use a lot more. And just to come back to the point I made at the start about um, responsible debate, respectful dialogue being everyday piecework. Well, actually, we, th there have been bad actors believe me, right into antiquity. People who have polarised um, people, people have you, who've done fake news, misinformation, disinformation, um, you know, inflammatory language, it goes a long way back. Social media is one of the things that helps it spread though, right? So one of the issues is not, we don't have new bad behaviours, but we have bad behaviours that reach further. But in our everyday piecework, actually, we all have access to social media if we want. It's debatable whether it's good for our health, and actually, I've stepped away from it for the time being. But I know that if we cede social media to all the bad actors, to people who are in their fight or flight mode, um, uh, or people who are actually being you know, more malicious, um, then we're ceding a really huge debating space, a space for dialogue, which actually we need to reclaim. Um, and we can reclaim that with everyday piecework uh, by using our superpower of empathy, by putting other stories out there, um, sharing other perspectives um, and that's one of the ways in which conflicts like Sudan, the conflict in the DRC, um, which again is one of the ones that's out of our news streams a lot, keeping those kinds of things amplified. Um, so there is work we can do using um, the bits of our, our psyche that are actually really powerful on this front. I agree. Last uh, <coughs> piece of emphasis before we're going to our audience, I think, Alice. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we've got quite a, quite a fair bit of time, which I, I, I deliberately made sure we do. And 
please, uh, two hands have shot up already, that's, that's great. Um, if we can, uh, you, you're welcome to ask a question or a number of questions or make a comment, a number of comments, but please you know, respect each other in the room and don't uh, be grateful if you could keep it as, as succinct as, as possible. Um, if you want to ask a particular panel member, feel free to, to also direct your question. So um, I'm going to take the, oh, we've got four hands. So I'm, I'll maybe take one on this side and then I'll go over and I'll, I'll alternate like this. So uh, we'll just take them one at a time at first. If there's so many hands that I need to maybe do three at a time, then we'll get to that later. But I'll just do, do one at a time now. So if we could uh, have this person here, please, thanks. And feel free to say who you are if you want to. It's Thank really you. up to you. My name's Claire Muir and I campaigned for human rights in Cyquads. And my question, I mean, you would call me a spoiler, but I'm not ashamed of that because Martin Luther King was a spoiler. I'm not as good at my job as he was, but I feel there's a right and wrong. I'm right and they're wrong. And that's why I'm banned from places. So how do you speak truth to power when power is so invested in a conflict of interest they're right because they they can abuse their power to shut me up we're just banned all of us anyone that's pro-human rights in mental health is banned that's wrong okay. thank, thank you so it's the questions about truth speaking truth to power how can you do that thank you so for example a jew cannot speak truth to power to a nazi that sort of situation where you're powerless, how would you speak truth to power? So, so truth to power, and, and are there some situations where there's just right and wrong? That's two points. Does anyone want to come back yeah, on that? Yeah, that's a great point. point. And uh, it, it is the constant uh, challenge is to hear and listen and to work out what can be done. And often it's single voices that then become mainstream because they build support. Now, your question goes further. What if you can't build support? What if you don't win supporters? Are you therefore doomed to remain on the margins, shouting from the outside? Uh, and that's a question for you as to how you project your issues and your beliefs and your passions and how you build uh, alliances, points of entry, in order to make it more meaningful, give it more traction, and possibly, hopefully, in, in the case that I think I've understood, uh, to mainstream it. Alice, you wanted to add to that? Um, yeah, just very briefly, um, I think just... Pointing to the Young Academy Charter for Responsible Debate, there are nine principles in it, and I think three of them speak to your question. One of them is speak with conviction for what you believe. Um, and so responsible debate and respectful dialogue doesn't involve everyone having to agree um, and being wishy-washy in what you say, um, having convictions. And I do firm, I agree on campaigning issues um, sometimes being very, very vocal. Quentin talked about this as a campaigner himself. I've been a human rights campaigner too. Um, sometimes being angry makes a difference. It really matters. And then you're using inflammatory language potentially, um, but sometimes that's actually required. At the same time, one of the other principles is really looking at those structures, the structures that enable some people to have more power and control over a debate and dismantling them. But as Quentin said, um, listening as well so it's not a, an either or but it's a both and um, for as much as speaking with conviction and and um, trying to dismantle structures that oppress um, uh, uh, also not overlooking some of those other tenets of responsible debate and respectful dialogue that mean that we can go beyond just standing with megaphones and shouting at each other because we do ultimately have to get beyond that position right thank you both um so I, I've got four hands on this side now, and I'm not forgetting the one hand over there. So I'm going to take the four over here, and then I'll just to save your your unless you do you want to get the steps, you know. <laughs> uh, and I will uh, I'll um, I'll take the four over here just to to save you uh, having to to go back and forth. And then, but if there's any more on this side, please do um, make me aware. They've got one at the front. Okay. So uh, just here, sir, and then I'll I'll. I'll 
Hello, my name is Gareth Morgan. I'm involved in various charities and campaigning organisations. Can I ask the panel what they feel about um, no platforming? Um, are, are there some situations where it is right to say, even if we believe in respectful dialogue, that there are some people I would not appear alongside because their views are so abhorrent? Um, or do you think that that shouldn't ever happen? Who wants to take that? That's difficult, isn't it? Um, There may be situations where somebody's views are so abhorrent and expressed in such a way that they show no respect for others with different views, in which case you may take the view as an individual that you should not appear on a panel with them. And I can see that and respect that. On the other hand, there's a multiplicity of views as we've been discussing today, and just because I don't, I don't like somebody else's views, or perhaps don't even like the person, it seems to be it's not a reason for not engaging with that person in the kind of debate or dialogue that we've been discussing this afternoon. Of course, it's how it's done, it's how it's curated, it's how it's convened, uh, at the safety of the space in which the uh, discussions take place. But I feel that we need to encourage dialogue and discussion, debate of the really difficult issues. Mm -hmm. And I fear that we may be moving away from that in a way which is ultimately counterproductive and creates silo mentalities and polarization, which may be even more unhelpful uh, than the alternative. But I'm, I'm, I'm just being very careful how I say that. Yeah, I, I used to support no platforming. I, passed motions on it in Students' Union a long time ago in St Andrews while studying classics, I hasten to add. <laughs> uh, I hasten to add, I have shifted my view. I was in a public meeting in, in Medellin in Colombia uh, when we were discussing the early peace process in the early 2000s uh, and a bunch of guys from FARC came in at the back uh, and were uh, a little bit disruptive. Now, the two Northern Ireland people on the panel got up and went to talk to them, and, but the organisers froze them out and called security. Uh, and that, to me, was a good example of rejecting the no platform thing and saying, we need to listen to you because you have uh, uh, things that everyone needs to hear. Uh, and that's why I think that the... UK, sorry, I can't generalise, some of the UK reaction to the uh, events of October 7th in the Middle East were wrong because they said, well, you can't talk to Hamas uh, because they're so bad and they've just done this horrible thing and therefore there's nobody to negotiate with, so how can you have a ceasefire? Because that'd be unilateral and that'd be foolish because these people would continue their war. And that has been demonstrated, I think, in the, in the nine months to have been wrong because uh, you might object to some of the methods, but the issues are so blindingly obvious that they still need to be dealt with somehow. Um, just, just very quickly, um, I think we need to ask ourselves, what platform are we talking about when we think about no platforming? And the, the cases that have arisen and become uh, um, well known tend to be a, you know, a student union here or a student union there. Who's got more publicity out of being no platform? The people who've done the no platforming or the person who's been rejected? Um, and, uh, you know, simply in kind of pragmatic terms, no platforming um, tends not to... Um, it, it tends to silo the debate rather than channel it in positive directions. Um, of course, there are people with um, views uh, which might be expressed and actually result in you know, prosecutions for hate speech. Um, and if they want to go and do that, then let's get our legislation... You know, going, legislation is slowly being tested through case law um, uh, uh, and, um, you know, it's not perfect and it, legislation can be used as a tool of oppression, of course. Um, but we do have some checks and balances in place which, um, which in theory, should um, uh, check for or, or, or help us, um, con help us, I don't want to use the word control, um, help us sift for hate speech. Um, but on the whole, no platform in A tends to be a, a sort of an admission of defeat, that we can't find ways to discuss um, that will 
you know, show up the flaws in these people's arguments. Um, and B, it tends to give other people, pe people whose views we abhor, the oxygen of publicity. Um, so for all of those reasons, I, I think it's to be done very, very selectively indeed. Okay, next question, person over here. Yeah. Thanks. Um, just to say thank you very much already. It's a really fascinating topic from all of you. Um, my question really is about a lot of what has been discussed seems to me at quite a kind of high level, you know, like international, difficult, massive, uh, huge issues and wars and so on. I'm just thinking if to, to bring it down to kind of um, a state level or, or Scotland, for example, um, when there are issues that are likely to cause division, such as climate change, uh, you know, needs, needs actions that might divide people. Um, and how we get to kind of some more ongoing um, mechanisms of having a debate so it's not just a kind of set piece where we come and maybe listen you know obediently and um, I don't mean that rudely I mean listen attentively and then we go home and think about it but somewhere where we can discuss more regularly those kind of issues I mean on a very small scale I'm thinking of like climate cafes they've got in Shetland you know where people are discussing a big issue about the as well. Yeah, well, yes, but we don't have very many of them. I just wondered if any of you have got thoughts about spreading this whole idea into a much more kind of deliberative, de democratic process throughout society. Great questions. Alice, do you want to go first? Just very quickly. So I've got an amazing team of students at the University of St. Hannah's who've been experimenting with Fleabag's Chatty Wednesdays. I don't know if all of you are familiar with the Fleabag show on... It's been on the BBC, I think. Um, but she, the, the main character runs a cafe, and on Wednesdays, everyone comes in and talks to someone they don't know. And my students have been... Think, have done a kind of trial of a sort of very, very formal debate, people proposing and opposing motions and responding um, and thinking about where that gets the conversation. Um, and then a, a debate that was actually supported by um, Vitali and Hannah Dushkova um, with mediation training initially um, and then a chatty Wednesdays. And you're absolutely right that these exploratory... What my students found was that debates where the conversation flows, where you're talking to people you wouldn't normally chat to, people from different backgrounds, different generations, um, people who aren't part of your bubble, means that the debate becomes exploratory. You come up with all those sort of creative ideas rather than kind of heading towards the direction of win, win, lo win, lose, as you do in a more formal debate. Um, so right from the bottom up, from, um, you know, from sort of very, very local uh, um, gatherings, that kind of thing then builds into sort of more participatory democracy um, and uh, citizens' assemblies and so on. And those iterative, slow conversations are really fundamental to democratic debate, but we don't invest resources in them enough, and it would be brilliant if we did. John, you wanted to come in yeah, on this as well? First of all, for, for the question and observation, two thoughts. One, I think everything we're discussing this afternoon is scalable up and down. So... Although we have be discussing some of the larger international issues, most of my work is bread and butter, local, commercial, um, recently neighbourhood neighborhood disputes. And all of these um, skills and techniques and ideas are applicable at the local level, the national level and the international level. So that's the first point. Second point, though, I think, is to pick up in your thoughts about deliberative um, approaches to discussion. I had the privilege of serving on the stewarding committee of the first citizens' assembly in Scotland. And it was a tremendous experience. What an interesting, interesting initiative. And then there was a citizens' assembly on the climate as well, climate change in Scotland. They produced very interesting, thoughtful and well-informed reports which have just gone nowhere, completely lost. Although the Cabinet Secretary at the time did say that the Scottish Government would take into account everything that the first Citizen Assembly had, had, had said. So I think there's huge scope for deliberative democracy, whether it's citizens' assemblies, citizens' panels, all sorts of ways in which people can be involved. And what I think I'd say to you is start, start, start yourself. Start local. There are, the tools are there now. The, the, the um, techniques are, are, are well-known or accessible. And think about how you and your local communities can engage people in the kind of conversations using the kind of techniques and skills we've, we've been thinking about today. I think it is the way forward, though. Vitaly, do you want to add to this as well? Yeah, I want to add... Um, when we came uh, to Scotland uh, and uh, there was the idea what we, what our next step should be, uh, we decided to help our Ukrainian community uh, doing training on emotional intelligence, so basically managing emotions and uh, mediation, conflict resolution training, because people 
uh, coming from Ukraine because of the conflict, ex actually affected by that conflict and had deep, deep trauma. Uh, and it helped community to open up um, and have those conversations that we rarely have, even being in community in a cafe, we rarely speak some of our personal experience. It helped people to release some of their emotions and speak about like their views and, and they felt that being heard. So that approach we uh, we used to um, build a project which now calls bring together we bring together people and communities so they can have these conversations and start, uh, have conversation in schools especially for young people because it is important for them to have a positive example of uh, conflict resolution of a debate of a dialogue because what we see in social media what would they see in their like uh, among the kids sometimes quite uh, scary because they use social media to to promote like how other kids are fighting which is which is i don't think it's it's really good um, and in globally we have this massive conflicts in ukraine uh in palestine and this is not a good example for for like for for many communities what is happening uh, what can go wrong and what could be an outcome of the conflict. And of course, people could be afraid. They could be afraid to have these conversations. So this is important to have this conversation. And bringing people together sometimes, now it's very difficult because we are on our gadgets, our telephones, computers, uh, and we don't go for meetings in person. That, that is very important because we communicate uh, not just verbally, but non-verbally as well. And this is a very important part of our um, uh, human human nature and it's good to have a like this conversation and a good feeling that I've been listened or I've um, I've heard some something interesting I've learned something interesting uh, and I want to address also about the abu um, uh, abuse of power S like with a uh, with a conflict in Ukraine uh, there was a conversation about why why negotiation is not happening uh, but it's important to understand like how the play how the play Ukraine and Russia. Uh, Ukraine has been abused, has been threatened and invaded. So how we can expect from 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 Ukrainians to have a conversation with someone who is more powerful? And in that in that situation, the the dialogue, the debate is not possible. So sometimes um, dialogue is not possible. Maybe there will be better times when there will be a dialogue and when we find a solution to the problem. But sometimes it's just maybe not having a, a, this debate is also um, a solution. So what stays in our control, what we can do in this situation is, is best to acknowledge and not like to worry too much about what we can do. Good, good uh, points and food for thought for all of us again. So, um, just before I take the next question, can, can I just get a reminder of who's who's waiting? Yes. Um, okay. So, question at the front, then I'll come to yourself, and then I'll come over this side and down to the front. Okay. Thank you. It's a really great conversation. Uh, my name's Pat Graham. I'm a retired entrepreneur, designing learning and development programs. Just the context: um, I was born in Derry and educated there. Went to university in Dublin. And the debating culture there was incredible. And what it did for me, it kind of influenced my learning and development um, from then on. It increased self-awareness. And I found myself in bookshops buying books around areas like empathy. I remember a book saying, Say It Straight or You'll Show It Crooked by Abe Wagner, who was saying, speak um, openly and get results. And so I was really pleased to be part of that culture um, and went on to um, understand my own behavior a lot more. I was in a job where the director of services, were, it was a bullying culture and no one was speaking out and the red mist descended and I decided to let the director know what I thought of him and his behaviours and not very nice language, etc. I was very ashamed of that and went away and reflected on it with a mentor, went into a bookshop, bought a book called A Sudden Outbreak of Common Sense, which was on alternative dispute resolution, went away and thought about that and then trained as the mediator. <laughs> um, but the one area I wanted to ask about I go back to Ireland and I left Ireland for lots of reasons I've never been able to resolve. And 
I wondered about the setting of ground rules for all sort of conversations and debates. Is that helpful? And also, in some situations, is it impossible really to have a debate because the issues of trust are really low and it's better to kind of preserve a relationship in some way as to kind of, if you like, I'm going to use this horrible word, demolish it in some way. I don't know if that makes sense. Trust and ground rules. Yeah. How important are they? Quinton, do you want to come in on this? Yeah. Uh, we hold trust up as really important. I'm not sure it is. You can negotiate with people you don't trust. Sometimes you have to. As Vitali said, we can't negotiate. We're in a war and the enemy is not going to talk to us because they're abusing us. Uh, uh, so uh, I think there are things that Ukrainians can do in terms of preparation, deepening democracy uh, uh, at the moment and in preparation for negotiations. Uh, and in terms of some of the big issues which will be debated, including land swaps, uh, which are going to be really, really tough. So there's context specific, uh, but I love the way you describe your, your self-awareness. Uh, and that, that is so important to reach the stage where we can engage uh, with people with whom we thought we had an irreconcilable difference, like are you Irish or are you British? Yeah. Choose. And the, ans the answer is you can be both. Yeah. You know, fantastically clever. I mean, the genius of the Good Friday Agreement was to split the difference really creatively, not to say, well, you can have half Irish uh, and I can be half British, but to uh, create the bigger sum game uh, with that. Uh, there was no trust between our negotiators. You know, just about they would turn up on time and they wouldn't, well, I was going to say they wouldn't swear, but they did. Uh, I mean, <laughs> no trust. And I mean, there were people with guns, you know, under the table, metaphorically, uh, and were using those guns during negotiations. So trust, sometimes we overrate, and you don't need to like them either, but you may need to do a deal with them. John, did you want to come in on this one? The ground rules question, I think, is, is an interesting one. And the answer to that is, is, is yes. Um, and what I would suggest is you try to um, work with the others with whom you're having the conversation, discussion or debate to formulate the ground rules that work for you in that particular context rather than imposing them. Mm -hmm. I actually prefer the word guidelines, but, but you know, because you get away from the sort of rule-based approach, but that's just me. But yes, to work together. To, to, uh, actually, I'm working on something just now, which um, is really interesting in that context. Back in the 1980s, Edinburgh University was uh, the convening institution for a series of meetings called the Edinburgh Conversations. Uh, as it happens, and I'll just mention this now, there's a, a, an event to celebrate these on September the 18th in the Edinburgh Futures Institute. Go on to Eventbrite and you'll find the tickets. I've been fortunate enough to access to the papers and to, to read about them. The Edinburgh conversations involved British, American, Soviet diplomats, officials, politicians, military folk. At the time when the Cold War was at its absolute height and there was no formal uh, negotiation or diplomacy really working at all. And so they started in a situation where there was absolutely no trust between East and West on either side. They worked because there was one person in Edinburgh, Professor John Erickson, Professor of Defence Studies, who was equally well uh, acknowledged and recognised in the Kremlin and the Pentagon, and that made, it, made a huge difference. But they had to create their ground rules. They had to work out simple things like where they sat, who spoke first, who chaired, what happened if somebody said something out of order, um, where meetings took place, and, and so forth and so on. And these had to be worked on together, collaboratively, collectively, with certain situations arising where people would say, no, that, that can't happen because blah, blah, blah. But that takes me to the second point, and it's about relationships. So again, there was absolutely no trust between uh, the, those folks, certainly between the, the West and the East, between the Russian. The Russians in particular did not trust the West because they thought that the West was going to uh, carry out a nuclear attack. In the building of relationships, the hard, hard graft that went into people just being together, listening to each other, having exchanges, frank exchanges on things 
issues about which they differed, somehow or other they built relationships sufficiently so that they became friends, they were able to discuss some of the most difficult issues that presented themselves during the 1980s, and it is said the Edinburgh Conversations played a part in the thawing of the Cold War. So if that can be done, and what you've achieved in Ireland can be done, and what Nelson Mandela achieved in South Africa can be done, and let's not forget his example, lots of things are possible. Hope. And you want to add to that, Alice? Yeah, and just taking it down to the small scale again, I think the things that both of you have said play out in, in the sort of the, the everyday family situations, workplace, um, local politics as well. Uh, up to a point, ground rules and trust kind of go together insofar as if you do have some established ground rules, trust can slowly grow. But you're right that actually converting that into an understanding that what you're really doing is you're growing relationships. That dialogue is one of the things that grows relationships and listening to multiple stories and confronting different people's experiences and uncomfortable truths actually can feel threatening to tribes and so on, but it can grow relationships and it can break down barriers. Just on ground rules more broadly as well, so the Young Academy of Scotland's Charter for Responsible Debate is not intended as a set of ground rules. It's intended as a set of suggestions that are designed actually to get people to be really reflective about how they debate. So the self, the, not, the, the, sort of the, the books that you were buying that um, got you thinking and being self-reflective um, are exactly what we intend those, um, those principles to be, not a set of rules that we should stick to. And none of the members of the team who put that together actually play by those rules in our family conversations a lot of the time. We get, it, we get told that we're not debating responsibly at that moment. Um, but what, the idea is that they're a kind of conversation starter and that they're a, 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 um, a set of principles that actually just get us thinking about how... How are we doing on this? And are there other principles that we actually ought to add in here? Or does this one really matter in this context? Can, can I tell you my South African <coughs> story briefly? Okay. Uh, one of the great urban myths now about the South African negotiations in the early 90s was that Cyril Ramaphosa, who's now president, was chief negotiator for the ANC and Rolf Meyer for the National Party, uh, that they went fishing. Uh, and they got to bond over the fly fishing or whatever they did. Uh, and I was working with them both in somewhere and I asked them about it and they just laughed and said, Quentin, have you never heard of a photo call? <laughs> um, please, next question. Uh, my name is Lark Sweetland, and like the lady who was speaking earlier, I have a background in learning and development. So I look, looked at a group of people who might not working, be working very well together and were, decided that they would like to find better ways of getting results. And it was a win-win-win for everyone when you could do that. But one of the curious things that I learned early on in doing that type of work is you could work with people for a while and ask them what do you think it is that we're here to work on? What have we decided we're going to focus our efforts on? And you get, you know, seven different answers from 15 people. So it was always good to come back to, now what's our scope of work that we're going to be trying to get progress on? And the other thing is, is uh, it came up where someone said, if I'd have known that I had to be prepared to change my mind, I don't know if I would have come. And everyone laughed, but he kind of meant it. <laughs> and I thought it was really good for, uh, as a facilitator, as someone who participates, to say, now that I've learned a little bit more about this, I'm thinking about it differently. So those are my two learnings that I got out of the type of work. That Thanks I for sharing those learnings. And does anyone want to reflect on, on those pieces of, of real insight and wisdom? I thought those were excellent. Okay, um, next question's here at the front. Uh, unf unfortunately, somebody's had to go by the, by the looks of things. So just here at the front, please. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Juliana. I'm from Scottish Youth Film Foundation. And I've got a question regarding responsible debate and uh, respectful dialogue. So if we have a situation when one of the parties uh, from which uh, they should be negotiating, but one of the parties that does not 
wish to step into those negotiations at all and um, instead of it it prefers use uh, force and the power of uh, um, power of force uh, what are the tools and mechanism we can mechanisms we can use to make this party to step into these negotiations and to uh, talk to another party I think you've assumed that I'm talking about the conflict in Ukraine right, right now and the party is Russia and um, yeah you've already mentioned partially uh, the answer on my question but I would like you to expand maybe other would like to join too thanks so almost how do we meaningfully bring people to the table, so to yes. speak? Yes, yeah. and reassuring them not to negotiate from the uh, position of force and not to, to use the words instead of uh, um, military power. Thank you. Any? Violence Could is a form of communication. They are saying something. Uh, and we need to understand that and all those points about empathy and myths and reality and so on. The other thing that we find useful is the concept of ripeness. When is a conflict ripe? Uh, and that, uh, at the moment, Ukraine-Russia is military, military, military. I know nothing about military strategy or whatever. People do that. I don't do humanitarian stuff. Other people do that. But when it comes to the ripeness of the moment, when there is a, often it's a stalemate and people have battered themselves uh, uh, into uh, uh, neither side being able to win and recognizing, and therefore we need to get out of this. The costs are too high the risks to my future or the cost to my country or in people or bodies, whatever is too high, therefore now is the time to negotiate. And being ready for that is really important. But if you miss that moment, it can take years before it happens again. So that's where the preparatory work uh, uh, is utterly important at this moment in that conflict and in many others. Um, probably you, you, you heard about the Ukraine peace formula which has 10 points and they're quite specific. It's like nuclear safety, it's returning children back to Ukraine, it's returning prisoners, soldiers and, and civilians as well who's in prisons. It's food safety. So like this interest that Ukraine put on the paper and saying this is important to us and this is what we want to achieve is actually one of the step, was a preparation steps and also discussing these issues with uh, with European partners, with um, Global South, with different countries who are involved and who um, could possibly be a third party into, in negotiations. So I think that's, that's important to, to clarify what, what actually needs are of the countries. Um, I'm, I'm talking about Ukrainian side. Um, I, I don't know what's, what the needs really, I don't understand the needs of the Russian. Uh, part, but uh, it's right said that there, there will be some window of opportunity when ne negotiations are possible. Till that time, I, I think it's it's not possible, and and we have to accept that. However, we are quite anxious about that what is happening, but we we, we have to accept that that reality. So I, I would. Just pick up on the point that the time made there. I, I don't quite understand what the Russians' needs are. I often have this in my day-to-day -day work as a mediator, so I'll take down to, down to I'll move it to that area if I, if I may. People sometimes say we would love to come to mediate with you, but the other party refuses to do so. And so there's a theoretical answer is that it's important in that situation to find out what it is that's going on with the other party. Why is it that they appear to be unwilling to take part? What are they perhaps frightened about? Go down a level. What are their real underlying needs? What is it they're really needing to achieve and concerned about? And we would call that in the language their interests. Mm -hmm. So you contrast from this position, which is a hard, I, I, you know, right or wrong, black or white, with underneath what's really going on. So I, I think what I would say is we need to explore, and it is about timing, quite accept that, but try to find out it's almost the answer to these questions of what's going on, why is it happening, how could it be done, who could be involved, 
Where would it take place? When would it occur? All of these open questions to elicit information, to at least find out what the possibilities are and what it is about these people who apparently don't wish to take part in negotiation that might help them to do so. That's great in theory. It doesn't always work in practice, but we often fail to do, to do even that. We simply assume that because they say no, that's what they actually mean. Un but under the surface, something else may be going on altogether. And if I can zoom out, so th there have been lots of really important points made there about conflict resolution and then conflict transformation. Um, but the other part of the piece that we need to think about is conflict prevention, right? And um, this is where I think we come back to stories and come back to the ninth principle in the Young Academy of Scotland Charter for Responsible Debate, which is about finding common ground. And the two things come together. You know, stories are world building. Words are world building. The stories that we tell shape how we think and how we feel and how we make decisions and how we behave. And we have told a lot of stories about conflict time and again, and we don't tell enough stories about peace, and we don't, therefore we're not so peace literate. We don't understand the slow, hard labour of it, of that relationship building, of dialogue. Um, I don't know if this is a myth or not, but one of the stories that's going around about Putin is that he spent a certain amount of time in, in COVID reading a lot about um, Russian history and Russian empire. And his, th that helps, helped, as the story goes, helped him flesh out his interests as imperialism as Mother Russia. But if we tell other kinds of stories that are about sharing, that are about finding common ground, that are actually about a common good beyond our national borders. And, you know, I'm an ancient historian. There weren't formal borders in the way, uh, you know, mobili human mobility was the norm. It, there are lots of things that are actually relatively recent that we think of as kind of eternal. Um, if we tell different stories, this, is, this might sound like it's incredibly naive and incredibly idealistic, but it is an important piece of conflict prevention. The storytelling that we do about war, about peace, about peace building, about commonalities, about um, a, 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 a things that might actually break down tribes, break down a sense of division, break down um, a, a, the, the drivers of conflict. That's important work that we can do in the everyday, day in, day out, um, that might mean that in a future conflict 30 years down the line, it's not quite such hard work to get at least a population behind a leader who's absolutely entrenched and won't come to the negotiating table. So, you know, potentially very naive, except that it is true that stories are world building and we can change the stories that we tell and that will change the world. Brilliantly said. And, and it reminds me of a discussion we had yesterday, which was about how much fiction and culture talks about dystopia and not enough about how do we build a utopia. <laughs> so um, uh, interesting, the, 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 the common themes that are coming up in these different discussions. I, I have two further questioners that have made me aware. Um, so I think if we can take one question after the other, and then I'll ask our panellists to reflect on those questions and anything else you would want to say in, in summing up, um, if that's OK. And I'll probably go um, from John to, to Alice, if that's all right. Thanks so much for such an insightful conversation. I think my question's changed a lot since I first thought of it. Um, but I made a note, I can't remember who said it. Someone said, who gets this platform? And we hear from them again and again. And I want to bring back the discussion back to the building we're in. We're obviously in a political space and a policy-making process. And... I say this having been a person that's given evidence to a committee, but this might be a building where can we take some of this learning and conversation and what would you say to change that process? I'm not just thinking about the policy making process and legislative process, but also about who is in the room, who the going back to power about who who is an elected official, what's their background. I'm a geographer and I think personally I believe everyone should study geography. It gives you such an important self-awareness, consideration of your positionality and so much more. Um, so maybe it would be interesting to hear more from Alice about engaging with younger people and children in this conversation. How do we start to empower people and give them the skills from a young age to be able to engage in responsible debate, dialogue, discussion, whatever you'd like to call it? And actually, I was also thinking about the application of some of what we've heard to Scottish politics and what happens in this building and um, elsewhere in politics. It's 
quite easy to see how you can apply some of this in circumstances where everyone's looking to get together and find common ground and make things happen now. But I guess sometimes politics is not about that. It's about winning the next election so that my party's ideas can be, can be implemented. So I guess in, in that second set of circumstances, what lessons can we learn from what we've heard today? Well, if, if I may reflect on that just briefly. <laughs> Not, not meaning to, um, you know, take advantage of this position of, of having the great privilege of being asked to, to chair this, this wonderful discussion, but I do think you've both touched on some very important themes in our 25th year of our parliament, because when I was, you know, much younger and this parliament was, con you know, the conception of this parliament and the referendum happened, there was an ambition that it would do politics in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I think 25 years on, we've got to take a hard look at ourselves as whether that's been realised. And part of that is about habit, um, but a lot of it's very deliberate. And that uh, one of the reasons, many reasons that I got involved in po party politics was to try and not just, you know, for me, it's achieve social justice, constitutional change, but also to, to build a better political dialogue. And I have to say that uh, if I'm honest, I don't think that's the prevailing psychology in this building amongst those who are elected and those who work for those who are elected and those who report on those who are elected. Uh, and I deliberately say all those three as a kind of triangle. Uh, so th there is an opportunity to make our politics better, but part of it is also what you touched on, which is actually getting to the point of having the opportunity to be on a ballot paper is is a very um, difficult journey, actually, and it's not the most in inclusive and um, empowering system. So uh, I think you, you both raised very important points and I've seen a lot of nodding heads around the, <laughs> the room, uh, which reassures me because I believe that the ambition of the public of Scotland is to see a better politics and actually yeah, yeah. the party political system is not reflective of that and it needs to change. So, uh, and just... One of the things I said in my first speech in this parliament was that we always need to keep in mind that all of us from our different perceptions and perspectives want to see a better Scotland. And if we keep that in the back of our mind, maybe we can make progress on all of this and the big challenges that we face that we need to have good politics to address in the next 25 years. So uh, thanks for um, giving me that extra space. And now <laughs> I better go to the panelists. Um, John first. This is our concluding remarks, is it, Ben, if I yeah, yeah, OK, please, well, can yeah. I just, first of all, thank you for your chairing, again, for your leadership, and, and, and hope that we can all support people like you with that kind of vision for the Parliament as we go forward. Graeme, I want to pick up on the point you made about um, common ground and so forth. And three words I'd like to say to politicians in this building are, get a grip. <laughs> and I'm, I'm deadly serious about this. The NHS is in a crisis... Which, from which it may not recover unless the party politicians in this place get a grip and work together, find the common ground and collaborate. Forget about five-year electoral cycles. But more than that, as a species, we face an existential crisis. Climate change is coming and its effects are going to be devastating. How much attention are the politicians really paying to this and how much are they working together to help us to mitigate and address the issues that will arise as a result of, a result of that. So, calm myself down. Uh, and what I'd like to do is, is encourage you all, uh, please, to be the change by taking the commitment to respectful dialogue and implementing it yourselves and encouraging others that you know to implement it and holding folk to account if they don't. And can I finally finish off with just a wee reading from a book um, which kind of nicely summarises where we are. This is, this is Richard Stengel, who helped uh, to Nelson Mandela to write A Long Road to Freedom. And he wrote a book about Mandela, Mandela's Way, Lessons in Life. And this passage, I think, is a nice way to round off uh, our, our talk. Shades of grey, he writes, are not easy to articulate. Black and white is seductive because it's simple and absolute. It appears clear and decisive. Because of that, we will often gravitate towards yes or no answers when a both or a maybe is closer to the truth. Some people will choose a categorical yes or no simply because they think it appears strong. 
But if we cultivate the habit of considering both or even several sides of a question, as Mandela did, of holding both good and bad in our minds, we may see solutions that would not otherwise have occurred to us. This way of thinking, he writes, is demanding. Even if we remain wedded to our point of view, it requires us to put ourselves in the shoes of those with whom we disagree. That takes an effort of will, and it requires empathy and imagination. But the reward, as we can see in the case of Nelson Mandela, is something that can fairly be described as wisdom. We need wisdom. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, John. Vitaly. Um, I think you, 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 you touched this point that it's important what the place is where, where we are. Um, and I'm reflecting on my experience in a court. In a court, you don't have opportunity to speak about emotions, relationships. You speak about facts and law and what do you want to achieve with your claim. And there is no space, for example, for mediation. So to have mediation, to have negotiation, you have to get out of court, go to the separate room and to speak to, um, uh, with the parties as a mediator. And this is important to, that we come to an understanding that something in an environment should be changed in how we engage, in how we communicate, uh, and how we want to reach better outcomes. And the same in the, like better politics. We want to have a better politics and something in the culture should be changed. Because if we are not changing our behavior, we will have the same outcomes. Thank you, Vitaly. Thanks. Uh, most of us have one appraiser in our jobs or our voluntary work or whatever. You know, the boss, the chair, the manager, whatever. Uh, ben has 70 or 80,000 voters. Just imagine how he has to please those people and give them what they want. So he has a really difficult job. Uh, and there is a paradox in that. And that's his point about the media as well, because he's more likely to get coverage to allow the good people of Leith and Edinburgh North to think this is a good guy if he makes a fairly speech against something. And the committee work that no doubt is done and the trade-offs and the discussions and so on are less newsworthy, uh, except for the possibility that within his party, he is seen as someone who can deliver something that is less shallow than some of the louder mouths. And therefore, that's what they want in a leadership team. Uh, so that's, that's the hope that maybe he uh, will hold out. For the rest of us, it is incredibly difficult. Uh, and uh, I, I was struck by the point about we, we can often talk about these things well, but we're hopeless in our family situations uh, and our neighbourly disputes. I have a neighbourly dispute at the moment where I'm just awful, I'm behaving very badly. <laughs> because I know the answer and the other party doesn't. Uh, I was like, my son reminded me that uh, the other day, he's now an adult, he said, Daddy, I remember when you tried to get uh, uh, me to stop playing with a banana as a gun. Uh, and I told you, Daddy, this is a banana. I know it's a banana. You know it's a banana. My brother knows it's a banana. Even if I threw it at him, it wouldn't hurt him. So give me a break. Uh, and so we all need to learn continually. Thank you, Quentin. Um, Alice. Yeah, um, so uh, Quentin's point about um, you know, Ben's constituents and, and uh, um, Vitaly's point about the culture of a place, they're very, very important. Quinton used the word newsworthy to describe, you know, what some of the work that you might do as politicians. And that does bring us back to storytelling. And you, you put the media in as the third triangle. And we often forget the role that the media plays in actually driving our cultures of debate and, you know, having news programmes that pit politician against politician when they'd be better off just having a kind of different kind of chat, really. A chatty Wednesday. Um, so, so that kind of structural systemic change does definitely need to happen. Um, but you put your finger on it in a way, and as did um, as did John, about the existential crises that that are bigger than an individual parliament and bigger than uh, um, any individual lifetime and and, and career path. Um, and it really does bring us back to that co that shared purpose. And if we can keep our eyes on the shared purpose that we all have. Um, then, and, and if we can also, um, one of the things that 
you know, we have a defence budget, but we don't have a peace budget, for example. There are structural and linguistic things that we can change about our culture of politics that might angle us towards thinking harder about climate change as actually part of, peace, you know, conflict prevention, peace building, um, com conflict transformation and so on. There are structural changes that we can make. So obviously your next job is to ensure that there is a peace minister and you know, this, is your, this, is, this, is, this is your to-do list coming up. Um, but we do need to do this. We can't, if we, we, we're not going, we, as much as we might try individually to change our personal behaviours, unless we're also working incrementally to change the cultures that we operate in, then none of it's going to stick. Because you're not going to win, right, by playing nice when everyone else is playing bad. And we need people like Ben in Parliament um, to keep doing the work that he does. But to come back to a couple of the other points about, uh, I suppose, structural change, power, um, and then young people... Um, one of the things that we could think about in the Scottish Parliament and beyond is um, who we value as experts. Um, and uh, um, select committees actually are getting better at going to a wider range of people, people with lived experience as well as theoretical experience and degrees and knowledge and that, that, that's acquired rather than earned and um, lived. Um, so thinking through who we understand as experts. And that brings me to the last... Um, question and point that I, I want to make, which is about young voices and young children. I know the Scottish Parliament does work bringing young people into Parliament on a regular basis. Um, but we have, um, we've got a lot of work to do on that front in treating young people as people who are knowledgeable, people who can do research, people who have not just lived experience, but actually knowledge by acquisition and learning. Um, people who are agents, not just, and, and political subjects, not just objects. Um, so in the, the UN, the United Nations has a youth peace security agenda, which um, m m you know, really um, makes, it, makes it clear how important it is to involve young people. Roughly youth is usually defined as 18 to 25 or sometimes 18 to 35. But actually it would be brilliant to see a children's peace and security agenda. And there is work in the space going on on this where... Um, organisations like Never Such Innocence, which is a charity that gives young people a, a voice on conflict, work with children aged 9 to 18. Um, giving them opportunities to debate multilaterally with each other, to think about really, you know, young people are impacted by conflict disproportionately. One in six children around the world right now are directly impacted by conflict, more are indirectly impacted. They are getting it on their social media feeds all the time um, and they have all sorts of expertise and all sorts of insight and not having this kind of strange cutoff where you know if you're under 18 you get talked to and if you're over 18 you can maybe be part of the conversation that's one of the many barriers um, that we could break down usefully and actually learn from uh, you know, learn from young people like we might want to learn from all sorts of other marginalized groups so that's all also on your to-do list. <laughs> Thank you, Alice. And uh, uh, it can be on our collective to-do list, right? Indeed. And uh, also just uh, negative campaigning, while it attracts more attention, uh, positive outcomes are what more people want. And I think that's something to always keep in mind too. Uh, unfortunately, we must end there. So much insight and wisdom from all of you and from our, our wonderful panel. Um, this is one of the final events in the Festival of Politics, so I hope you'll think about coming back next year. You will receive uh, the opportunity to give feedback on the festival so, and on today's event, so pl please do if you, if you feel inclined. I would just like to say a big thank you to our two members of the Parliament staff who have looked after us today. Um, uh, and all their, their colleagues. Uh, and a, a big thank you to John, Vitali, Quinton and Alice. Yes? yes. <laughs> I just want to share to you um, a quote from the book uh, by William Uri that John uh, picked up in his... Final uh, wisdom. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, in his blog uh, at uh, The Scotsman, uh, which is, if not you, who? If not now, when? Well, for really effective, effect, excellent cheering.
Thank you to all of you. Look after yourselves, stay involved and have a great weekend. Thank you.